Five years ago, I used to be so jealous of Soho, and now it's half ten. There's no one about. What's happened here? I don't get it. Manchester is bouncing. These people that move into busy, thriving areas where you know there's a successful nighttime economy and they complain about the noise, they're damaging people's lives. If you want to live a quiet life, don't move into Soho. Sasha Lord, welcome to Politics Show. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming in. Shall we start with, could you explain in layman's terms, what is a night czar? So firstly, I'm not a night czar. They tried, they, they were... Yeah, so no, they were looking at different titles um, back in 2018 when I was appointed. The night czar was, mm, czar's a bit weird. Then nightmare was thought about. And I can be a nightmare, I know that, but I didn't want to be, have that official title. So I'm the nighttime economy advisor for Greater Manchester. Um, and essentially, shall I tell you how it came about? So when it was decided that Greater Manchester were going to be given more devolved powers back in 2018, I was at that point where I was a bit miffed because I've been a promoter since 1994 and different authorities around the UK were giving different preferential treatments over the nighttime economy. And most places, not necessarily Greater Manchester, but most places just saw us as a, a bit of fun. Let's just tuck them away. Oh, it's only a pub. It's only a nightclub. Actually, we're the fifth biggest industry in the whole of the UK. So I went to most of the hostings and said to each one of the candidates, look, would you support the idea of a task force that can represent the nighttime economy in Greater Manchester? Most of, well, all of them, bar the guy from UKIP who had to stand down actually because he was caught on a sex website dressed as a nun, uh, yeah, as, you, as you do. Um, so he had to stand down from it. But Andy Burnham won. And t very, very sadly, 10 days, two weeks after that, there was an attack on the UK, but, but an attack on the arena in Greater Manchester. Um, 17th of May, 2018 it was. And I w there, there was something called One Love, which was 10 days after, that was, that was put together very quickly. I don't know if you remember it, Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande, yeah. Um, you know, Chris Martin, Miley Cyrus, Katy Perry, huge, huge names. And for me, it was a very much a global event, which was incredible. They had millions and millions of people watching it. That was for 50,000 people. I had my festival, Part Life, for 80,000 people a week after that. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be good to do something that was thanking the people of Greater Manchester. And purely by coincidence, we had the 1975s headlining that had that Manchester link. Mm. So I got the local paramedics up, the police, hoteliers that opened the doors that night, taxi drivers, counsellors. And I said to Andy Burnham, would you like to come and say a few words? And he did. And that one moment, I'll never forget for the rest of my life because 80,000 kids at Park Life are normally going absolutely nuts. You know, it's, it's anarchy in those fields. But that moment, you could hear a pin drop and p many, many people were crying, actually. And it wasn't tears of sadness, it was tears of sorrow. We had, Greater Manchester had beaten the terrorists. That's what it felt like. You're not stopping us. We've got this huge party that's going on. But the conversation started from there. And then 12 months after that, Andy actually asked me to take the role on. And I always thought there'd be a task force of maybe 20 people made up of NHS operators, hoteliers, counsellors, police, all advising the mayor. But ultimately now what he wants me to do is I co-chair that meeting with them and report directly back to him. That's an incredible, it's a huge global moment, what will happen with One Love and with Park uh, Life as well. It's, it's something I'll never forget. You know, it's I didn't know until the actual day itself because obviously the, the police and counter-terrorism have to make knee-jerk reactions, how to change things around. And what's really interesting, and I think this is the spirit of, you'll have to count how many times I say Greater Manchester in this, but this is the spirit of Greater Manchester. The morning after it happened, and I was watching it on the news, I was watching it on Sky News actually, I honestly thought a base had blown up or something, which is quite common sometimes. And then it was very apparent that, no, there was a terrorist attack, 22 people lost their lives. Um, and, you know... Many, many more of 100 more were very, very injured, um, life-changing injuries. But what was the most Manchester thing that's ever happened to me in my lifetime was I, my first phone call was at 8 o'clock the following morning. And it was from Greater Manchester Police, head of licensing, a guy who's retired now called Ronnie Nielsen. And he said to me, Sasha, Parlife's going ahead. This has come from the top. It's business as usual. 
And that's exactly what we did. And I think most people listening to this will remember those images of people in St. Anne Square singing Don't Look Back in Anger. That was not orchestrated. One person started to sing and everyone came together. And that was, I think the UK saw what comes out of our city region at that point. That was what was really striking about it, was how people came out the next morning. And then the One ne Love was shortly afterwards, wasn't it? The one Love was, was brought together. I mean, the two people that pulled that off was Melvin Benn, the promoter called Simon Moran, and obviously Ariana Grande and Scooter Braun, her ex-manager. But global stars. And the weirdest thing that happened was I managed to get a AAA pass, Access All Area pass, and obviously, I knew all the big hitters were there, so I wanted to test the pass, see how far I could get. And every single layer of the onion, getting behind main stage, I thought, all right, okay. Then actually, I was heading towards the changing rooms. I thought, they're definitely going to stop me at the changing rooms because they'd converted. Um, it was at the cricket ground. They converted the cricket changing rooms into, I think it was 15 different um, rooms for all the different artists, the big hitters. When I got there, I realised I'd be allowed in because at the same time, Pharrell Williams walked in. He opened the door for me. Quite as right. Like, as, you, as he should have done. He yeah. would have called you the night czar. <laughs> <laughs> but I walked in there and it was a real pinch for moment. And I do suffer really badly from imposter syndrome. And you know, I didn't go to university. I got two U's and an E. It wasn't the best day in, in my family um, when, I, when I failed everything. But I walked in, I was thinking, how on earth did I get here? And they were all bobbing around. Justin Bieber was there. Miley Cyrus was there. There's a bit of a buffet going on. They were helping themselves. And then there was this moment where everyone just stops what they were doing. And this orange cagoule walks through and it was Liam Gallagher. And I don't know why that was so special for everyone. I think maybe because he was a Manchester artist. There was all this rumour. It's Liam. Is Noel going to turn up? No, they can't do because we know Noel's on holiday. We know Liam's performing in Germany. But actually, he got a private jet to come back for that performance. So you didn't know he was coming? We didn't know he was coming. That's an extraordinary and story. I think that moment brought his career back again. Right. Convinced of it. That one moment. Did He, he sang with... Uh... Chris Martin. Did... Yes. Who, who, funnily enough, he'd slagged off two years previously. Um, but yeah, he did. He sang with him. Everyone pulled it together. Yeah. What was it like in the crowd? Were people people nervous to come in there? I've never seen as many police around an arena before walking up to it. Um, I think the simple answer was yes. The city region was in shock for, for months, I'd say, after that. And every time there's an anniversary, you know, we're still reminded exactly what, what went on. Um, last year was the fifth anniversary, so that was a you know, special moment. But... It was actually, people were in shock, people were scared, but people were celebrating. And I remember scenes of the main floor area, which must have had 40,000 people there, and circles kept appearing where people were dancing in the middle of circles, but with police. Right. And it was just a really nice moment. That's a nice moment. It is. I mean, okay, so you had two U's and an E, did you say? Two. My E was in art, in which art? I'm really proud of. Art. What were your U's in? Uh, English lit, and you're going to laugh if I tell you the next one. Go Politics. On. Politics? Yes. Oh, good. Good. That, that's shall why... I, shall I leave? Yeah. <laughs> so. That's why you didn't get the full promotion. Correct. <laughs> well, so, okay. So tell me about... Like, this is all in Tales from the Dance Floor, which is the book yes. that you have, you've written. But tell me about how you went from there to running a club night in the Hacienda. So I... There are two bits of luck that I've had in my life. Um, and I believe everybody has to have a bit of luck to succeed you know, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you can throw everything at it, it's mopey blue, but I think you do need a tiny bit of luck. My two factors were, number one, I was born in Manchester, and number two, I was born in the year that I was, because it meant that when I was in my sixth form, it coincided with something called Madchester. So if you think about Stone Roses, New Order, Happy Mondays, Factory Records, and there was a nightclub called the Hacienda, and all the kids, all the cool kids in my school were talking about the Hacienda. The Hacienda is the place. This is the place. And I'd heard about it. You know, the, the world were looking at what was going on at Manchester. It was such an exciting moment back then. And I think we're about to have that moment again, by the way. But we'll probably get on to that in a do minute. Do you really? I do. It's, it's a, something special is about to happen. Um, but I went, left school and worked in a clothes shop for £20 a day. But, and these people were coming in. It was a high-end clothes shop. So I was measuring legs at the age of 18, but for Armani trousers or, you know, posh, posh stuff. 
And I was thinking 20 quid a day, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not cutting the mustard. I want to do something. I knew I loved music. I knew I loved the Hacienda. And then just one day I had this light bulb moment. I thought, I'm going to put a party on at the Hacienda. I'm going to put a student night on. That was my first mistake. I did put a student night on. But when I went into the Hacienda for a meeting during the daytime, he said, OK, fine. This, this can be your date. It's a Monday night. He wants £1,000 plus VAT. I'm pretty confident they never paid the VAT to the HMRC. Mm -hmm. I left there thinking I was Peter Stringfellow. I thought I'd done the deal of the century. <laughs> Looking back now, no one, even now, 30 years later, would pay £1,000 for a Monday night. But also... I said I wanted to put a student night on. They'd give me the first Monday after all the students had left, 4th of July, 1994. Oh. So that was a big They error. did you over. They did me over. Mm. But do you know what? I managed to break even. I kind of blagged it. Mm -hmm. So I went around all the shops in Manchester and said to people, I spoke to the managers, and if you ever say to someone, look, I'm going to tell you a secret, don't spread this. It's a good chance people are going to spread the word. So I said... I'm from the Hacienda. That was a lie. I wasn't. From the Hacienda, we just want to thank you for all your support over the last 12 months. We've got this special party, VIP party, where Manchester United are coming down, Take That are coming down, M people are going to be there, all these megastars. And I was lucky that I knew Justin Orange, who's the identical twin of Jason Orange from Take That. The people, were t they, they turned up, and I think I had 773 people through the door, and I made a few hundred pounds, which on a Monday night is not bad. Mm -hmm. charged a fiver. And after a few drinks, people can you said such and such. Body was said, well, look, there's Jason Orange over there. And right. Ah, oh, fine. And we managed to get away with it. Right. So trickery. Trickery. But yeah. I had the bug. I'd put a night on and then I started running a few student nights from there. And, but if you'd said to me back when I was in the sixth form at school, and I went to a good school, I went to Manchester Grammar. So a lot of people in my class were going to Oxford, Cambridge, St. Andrews. I flunked. If you'd said to me, look, 30 years later, you would have co-founded biggest nightclub in the world. You've co-founded the biggest metropolitan festival in the UK and been an advisor to the Mayor of Greater Manchester. I would have said you've, you've stolen the confiscation box, the Hacienda, that's impossible. Well, talk to me a little bit about, so when you're, you worked in the Hacienda and you've worked in many clubs and you've created club nights, you've created festivals, co-founder of festivals. Co-founder. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, warehouse project, how do we, yeah. how do you describe that? A night or a... Warehouse project is um, a series of events that takes place end of set, mid-September now through I mean, to, I know what it is. So I was, to, <laughs> is uh, I was have a you regular. Been? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Big um, fan of your work. Good, thank you. That's good to know. So <laughs> we're now at Mayfield Depot, which is a disused railway station, capacity 10,000. And, you know, it's it's fantastic mm. just to see 10,000 people. It reminds me many ways of back when I started off, because when you went into clubs back in those days, it didn't matter what you were wearing or whether you were saying, seen with a bottle of Grey Goose or the sparkler coming out of it. It's not about that. It's about purely the music. And when you come to the warehouse project, that's it. Mm. How different do you think nightlife is now then? From, from the Hacienda to when you're putting on a warehouse project now, how, what are the different restrictions or what are the different barriers that are in place, if any, compared to then? So if you'd asked me whether I'd prefer to operate in 1994 or operate now, most definitely now. Really? 100%, because as you'll see in the book, back when I started off, I was shot at. Mm. I had petrol bomb attacks. Um, it was pretty nasty. And that's just not a Manchester thing. That was a, a national thing, Birmingham, London. And that was just the first student night you did? That was just the first couple of weeks, yeah. yes. So they were very taxing days. And uh, now there is a lot of red tape about it. But the positive thing about that is once you get over the bureaucracy and the red tape, the legislation kind of controls what goes on inside. So, for example... Warehouse project, we have 124 security. We have 400 bar staff. When you walk through the front door, 400. When you walk through the front door, everyone's ticket gets checked. You think it's a ticket check. It's not. It's an attitude check from security to make sure if you had too much to drink or anything. You then go through knife arches. You walk past the drug sniffer dog. You get patted down. The bags get searched, which has come out of Martin's Law um, from the arena attack. There were no bag searches in place back then. Um, then we've got welfare walking around, making sure people are okay. We've got three ambulances, 12 paramedics, doctors. That wouldn't have happened back in 1994. So in a way, it's, I think it's probably turned into a proper business. I'm talking about events in general, festivals. 
um, more so than when it was back then. Right. When you're talking about bureaucracy and red tape, what do you mean by that? Um, I think sometimes, well, I don't think I know, if somebody applies for a nightclub licence, automatically it feels like you're on the naughty step. It does. At no council in the UK are going to go, great, we've got another nightclub on the door. That's exactly what we need. And I think it's a really blinkered approach. Um, I think we should be welcoming more events. We should be welcoming more nightclubs. It creates a bouncing economy, a bouncing nighttime economy. When you go to a nightclub, for example, well, I can use Warehouse Project because I, I can talk about it on a personal level and part life. Forget what happens within the Warehouse Project itself. But that brings in about 14 million to the local economy over those three months in terms of taxis, hotels, new outfits, restaurants. It's the same with the festival it brings. Part life brings 13 million to the local economy. So you take the nightclub away and it has a domino ripple effect because you don't just leave your flat, go straight to a nightclub. You probably will go for a drink beforehand. You might get a taxi there. You probably get a taxi back. Depending from where you're from, you might have a greasy kebab after it. You know, so there's all these things that you have to think about. And I'm now looking at red tape that's taking place in other areas of the UK. And I just think it's the wrong approach. And when you're closing places down, I would argue very, very strongly that it's a dangerous approach as well. Mm. Because if you close a club or if you decide you're going to close certain boroughs down at 10 o'clock, people aren't going to start saying, well, do you know what? I'm not going to, I'm going to stop drinking then or I'm going to stop dancing. That's not the case. People go to the supermarket They'll load up there and they'll go to a house party where there's no reg regis legislation and there are no paramedics or security. And that's where things can go wrong. Why don't you think councils recognise that? I think we're doing I think we're doing a good job in Greater Manchester. I think we've always recognised that. I'm looking at other pockets of the UK where they're not, because I said at the start, I think they sometimes see, well, it's just a pub or it's just a club, or it's just a live music venue. Live music venues are really, really suffering at the moment. And if you take the live music venue away, Stormzy, Ed Sheeran, they didn't become stars overnight. They started at grassroots venues, mm. and they cultivate it. And unless we can protect these venues, then in five, six, seven years' time, there will be no festivals, because we'll have no headliners. It'll become boring. Yeah, well, a lot of experience, well... Things that I've experienced have been that, you know, good venues have closed down because um, they might have been too loud. There might have been a licensing dispute. Normally it is a local resident who's put in a complaint. On, this, I'll never forget the blind tiger in Brighton. I'm still mad about it. Someone moved in above the blind tiger and didn't like hearing the bass from downstairs. But how outdated is that law? It is absolute nonsense. That, and we've had it recently, actually, in Manchester. There was a venue called Night and Day. And... Uh, I actually blame the solicitor here that did the conveyancing because during lockdown, somebody bought the apartment attached to night and day. Now, if the lawyer had actually done more than a two-minute check, he would have realised that there'd be noise issues with that venue, but he or she didn't. So the person moved in, we came out of lockdown, what happened? Noise started. One person can, can put complaints in. And if environmental health go around and say, yeah, that is a problem, they can shut it down. It doesn't matter how long the venue's been there. It could be there one month, it could be there 30 years. That's still the case. So what we need to implement is something called agents of change. Mm -hmm. And what agents of change is, is let's say you've got a live music venue and I'm a developer. Well, I'd never be a developer, actually, they're horrible. But let's pretend I'm a developer and I want to build some apartments next to your venue. Agent of change means it's the onus on me to fully soundproof it so that when you put your noise on, it's not going to affect any of the people who are paying mortgages in there or paying rents in there. Likewise, so I've now built this and it's, it's soundproofed. If you decide you want to rip out your sound system, put a much louder one in, then the onus is on you to soundproof it. And to me, that is such a no-brainer. It is, and it's something we are now adopting in Greater Manchester. Right. But then, I mean, what do you do then for the more... Um I guess, historical issues that you might have. So, I mean, for example, I, I can speak mainly to London. So I'll give you an example of London, and then you can come back with a Manchester example. Okay. But there was um, a great pub that was um, up in Islington, and it was a pub that Orwell used to drink in. You know, it's been there a really long this. time. And uh, someone moved in next door. They had a, a young child, and they put in a noise complaint, and Islington Council decided that it was probably right that the pub closed down. Now, anyway, through after a long campaign, the pub stays open. Yep. 
But what do you do in that situation? Because you can't soundproof a, a 400-year-old pub. You can't. I mean, each one, I think there's not one two fits all for it. Each one's got to be taken in its own merit. But certainly, I think the approach that the council were looking at there, of saying, well, shut the pub down, it's completely the wrong approach for one person. And agents of change there wouldn't have helped that pub because it's 400 year, mm. years old. Um, but there should have been a more adult conversation. Maybe the pub and the council contributing to soundproof the flat was something I, I'd certainly propose. The one thing that I proposed actually with night and day that I thought was an absolute no-brainer was, okay, fine, there were big music artists coming out, like Johnny Marr, for example, from The Smiths, Guy Garvey from Elbow, all supporting it. So I thought, well, maybe let's put a pop concert on with a crowdfunder. Let's make enough money. This will shock you. You can buy an apartment in Manchester for 150 grand. Only shocks you because I've seen how much they are in London, right? You won't get a shoebox. Hurts me every time. Yeah, sorry. And that's a nice, that's a nice, that's a posh one. But um, buy the flat, buy the apartments, and then allow travelling bands who are playing there to go and stay in there for the night. That was the solution I put forward. Okay. That's quite pragmatic. I think so. Every single person wins. The person who owned the apartment would win. The band would win. The venue would win. The council would sleep at night. Complete mm. no-brainer. How often are you um, intervening or I mean, even just seeing, actually, uh, disagreements about licensing? So I'm, I'm seeing it constantly. And I think <clears throat> something really weird happened during lockdown. Mm. Uh, because I've got the freedom, as I said from the beginning, from Andy Burnham. He just let me crack on and do exactly what I want. Um, and I started fighting not just for Greater Manchester, but for the UK. I did something that was for Greater Manchester, but it actually benefited venues across the whole of the UK. And I was the person that took Matt Hancock to the High Court um, over the 10 p.m. curfew and the substantial meal ruling. And I've got to be honest with you, one of my, my favourite parts of the day is just before I go to bed, I let the dog out. I go and spend a penny in the downstairs loo and it's framed there above the toilet, Sasha Lord versus Matt Hancock in the High Court in my <laughs> favour. And I just look at it and laugh, thinking about his cheesy little face every night. Um, but that benefited places across the whole of the mm. UK. And I think because of that now, when there's an issue, people tend to tap me up. So it doesn't matter whether it's in Manchester or Leeds or Sheffield or London or Birmingham. Um, and if I can, I will help and reach out. You became one of the most prominent figures during lockdown, certainly during the later stages of lockdown, when you were standing up for hospitality. What did that feel like to take on the government? In the way that you did. In a time as well, we forget now, but in a time when a lot of people didn't want to speak up or didn't want to, to go against the grain at all. Well, to this day, my wife still doesn't know how much it cost me, that, that court case. Um, it, was, it was a lot of money, but I do it again, you know, because it saved businesses, it saved jobs. And there were so many things that were completely and utterly wrong. I knew with a 10 p.m. curfew, I knew they had not taken any advice whatsoever from anyone that knew what they were doing. One of the hardest things for me with 80,000 people in a park is a staggered egress. I'm talking about park life. How do I get 80,000 people out at the same time? The answer is you can't. You've got to stagger it. So you, when you go to a festival, you might think, well, why, did, why is that stage slightly quieter towards the end of the night? Or why did they shut that one half an hour earlier? And customers actually get angry about that, but there is a reason for it is to create that staggered egress because otherwise transport falls down and right. the whole system breaks. And I remember waking up on the morning after the first 10 p.m. curfew had been implemented and I saw the pictures down here actually, I think it was Oxford Street, where the, the underground tube was overflowing. It, it looked like people had just been leaving Wembley. Mm. And I thought, that is dangerous. You know, there is a virus out here and you've just thrown hundreds of thousands of people out at exactly the same time. You're spreading the virus. You're the one that's doing the most damage. And that was the reason why we won the first, the first case. The second one, the substantial meal ruling. Do you want to know how we, we won that one? Please. You're sure, okay. It's quite boring. I'll tell you. I do not find this boring. So <laughs> um, I had a genius QC, now Casey, called David Locke. And he looked at pubs in Greater Manchester and at the time, we had 1,806 wet lead pubs. Mm -hmm. Those are pubs that don't serve food, just alcohol. 
And he did some more digging. The vast majority of those were in our most deprived areas. So his argument was, why is it right that I could go to a gourmet pub with my wife, although it's table service only, social distance, we could sit there, have a sandwich, have a pint, wave at our mates on other tables, have social activity. But actually that was taken away from people in our most deprived areas. And that's how we won the case. That's really interesting because that also is, I'm actually thinking about where I was living and it was an area where you didn't have a lot of outdoor space and a lot of people didn't have, if they had outdoor space, it was a balcony. You didn't yes. have, you know, you didn't have a garden and even that was probably not that wide. And they were all wet pubs. Yeah. So you're being, you're being double hit by that. Double hit. That's so interesting. And what was really interesting, when we reopened again, the vast majority came back into my office because most of them had been, and I'd never thought about this. I was in such a fortunate position, still am, to have a bit of a garden. I could sit out in the, do you remember the amazing weather we had to begin with? Yes. It was a scorch, you know, I'd sit outside <laughs> in the garden. Most that work in my office, you're right, if at best had a balcony. And when I think back now to sit in a one bed flat by yourself, maybe during that period of time, it must have driven people insane i had 20 in my flat oh. it was a 20 person flat everyone had a bedroom it wasn't okay. like a you know a flat? It was a, it's not buckingham palace is it? it was like a warehouse yeah okay up in, wow. yeah in uh in clapton wow um we had a great little segment outside that we'd uh put, put some bins around that was our outdoor space nice it's really nice classy it was, it was chic yeah. um, <laughs> so earlier you were talking about um the number of people the sheer volume of people who work in hospitality. Yes. When you're talking about park life or when you're talking, when you, you know, when you're putting on uh, the warehouse project, mm -hmm. the number of people that are employed directly or in subsidiary roles, yeah. you're, you're, you're probably getting to near a thousand at least if you've got 400 people at your bar. In any yeah. other sector, if you were going to close something down, it would probably make the national news, right? Absolutely. Like if you were going to shut down, I don't know, a car factory. Yeah it would make the national news. So why don't the government take hospitality that seriously? Do you know, this? Is, so it's not a government bashing, but something really, really weird has happened. So the PM, when he was chancellor, did actually support hospitality mm. during that period. Now, obviously, it's a completely different argument now, but the time when he came out for Eat Out to Help Out, that was obviously to help hospitality. It really was. Mm. And then... When he reduced VAT from 20% to 5%, that undoubtedly saved businesses and saved jobs. And I was in many, many meetings when these conversations were taking place, and they really did understand the importance of the fifth biggest economy. Since he became PM, the walls have come down. It's as if they're not interested. And every time I see one of those pictures where one of the cabinet ministers, and I don't know why they do this. They love the picture pulling the pint. What's that? Why did they do that? Or sat there with a pint? You know, it... it You'd have to tell me. I'm not I sure. I can't tell you. They're hypocritical. And Jeremy Hunt, after the last budget, posted on the Sunday, but you retweeted my tweet, actually, posted on Sunday a picture of him sat in a pub that, by the way, was dead. There was no one in the background with a pint. And it's like... We froze alcohol duty. Well, they did, but that's as useful as a chocolate teapot. Mm -hmm. And when you look at alcohol duty, alcohol duty on a pint is 20 times more than it is in Germany. And it, you'll know people who've gone to Gran Canaria or Portugal and paid one euro 80 for a pint. Now you're seeing prices yeah. like, well, you're seeing seven pounds. I've seen seven pounds 80. It is ridiculous. Do you think that's ethical to charge £7.80 for a pint? I don't think it's down to the operator. They're squeezed that much now. And it's not just the alcohol duty. When you look at utility bills, there are pubs now paying still £400 away, £400 a day mm -hmm. for electrics. <laughs> I wrote to Richard Riley, the CEO of Ofgem, because I was so annoyed when, do you remember the utility bills 12 months ago were every day getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And people were panicking and they were locking themselves into three to four year contracts. And that's why people are still paying £400 a day for electrics. And I wrote to him and actually he always gets a kick in, but fair play to him. He got on the train, came to Manchester to see me. We sat down and yes, companies like Shell, companies like British Gas have reported record profits. I think British Gas were 300% up on previous years, whilst people are 
you know, struggling whether they're going to eat or heat their, their places. And that really doesn't sit right with me. But what he pointed out was is the government needed to step in and give Ofgem more powers to break up the energy brokers because the brokers were going in there and panicking people to lock into these contracts, knowing this would come back down again, which it has. So the overheads are so high now when running a pub, a restaurant, a bar, that we're now reaching that point. And you've you just made that point yourself where if you see the price of a pint is north of seven pounds, you're kind of thinking you're having your leg pulled a little bit. And I think the general public think, well, it's just the landlord that's charged me that. But he's got no other way to, to survive other than to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think we are reaching the point now where actually the customer is going to start to walk away, especially with the cost of living crisis. Mm. I will come back to you about the, the heating, but I would like to push back on your, your £7.80 thesis because okay. I would say that quite a lot of pubs that charge that are actually owned by huge breweries or owned by huge companies. And actually, yep. I would, a lot of the smaller pubs actually have been absorbing the cost and keeping the price down. Uh, you're right. So I was talking about the independents, mm. the independent pubs, but those bigger chains, and uh, you, people know what I'm talking about. You don't need to talk about it. But those, those big, big pubs change are making huge profits, mm. huge profits. So in the smaller pubs, I mean, a lot of them have been acting, particularly through the winter, they've been acting as community centres. They've been acting as, you know, warm banks, yep. particularly in areas where there might not be a local library anymore. Or there's not, you know, a cafe. People go to the pub. And so do you think that with the high cost of energy that they were facing, do you think that perhaps the government should have provided a subsidy the same way that they do to community centres? I think, well, the, the simple answer is yes. I think the one solution that would definitely save businesses and save jobs is another VAT reduction. And that's the one thing I've right. been banging the drum about for the last two years. So when they reduced it to 5%, it was amazing. Three months later, he put it back to 12.5%, which is still okay. <laughs> Three months later, back to 20%. So we only had a six-month break really there. In hospitality in Europe, the average is between 7 and 8% for hospitality. We're 20%. Hospitality is taxed more in this country than any other country in Europe. And even if they reduced us to 12.5%, would still be more expensive than 26 other countries in Europe. So wh where's the shift been? I know that you said that Sunak was, was uh, seemingly, his policies were pro-hospitality when he was Chancellor. Now that he's PM, he's withdrawn from, from that obligation. Not interested. So what is that? Is that Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor, do you think? Where is it coming from? He I suspect would be in charge of the, uh, we, we suspect it's Jeremy Hunt. Um, there's no conversation, there's no communication whatsoever. Literally, the walls have come down, um, and it's heartbreaking to see. You know, hospitality in, in other countries. This is another bugbear of mine. I think a lot of the public. I'm calling out the public a lot, aren't I? But a lot of the public think, well, if you work in a pub, it's a Saturday job, or it's going to get you through college, or it might get you through university. If you go to Italy or France or Spain, mm. it's a life choice. That is your vocation and you do it for the rest of your life. And do you know what? There's a good chance your mum and dad have also been in this sector as well. You're proud of hospitality. You're proud of your job. And I want to create that in the UK. And I do think it's possible. I really do. But how are you going to do that? Because a lot of... Okay, well, if we're going to talk it, talking in broad strokes, if we're going back to the 50s and 60s when businesses stopped being or pubs stopped being completely independent, yeah. people sort of lost a, well, I, I guess you would lose a, a love and obligation because if you're working for a huge conglomerate, you're naturally yeah. going to care less. So, I mean, how are you going to resolve that? Are you going to go in and break up all of the chains? No, I, I think obviously baby steps. But I think one thing I would most definitely like to see is you can study tourism at university. I think you should be able to study hospitality. Um, arguably, hospitality is, is bigger than tourism. Uh, well, certainly at the moment, why would you come to the UK uh, near water when it's full of sewage? You know, it's not exactly selling us, is it? Mm. Um, but that's, that's another conversation in, in itself. But I think that's the starting point. College, university, you should be able to study hospitality. Mm. What do you think the effect of that would be? You think that it would give more credence to the role? It would do. Right. Hmm. And it's not, not just the pupils seeing that, because I think the parents would respect it more as well. What effect has, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up, what effect has Brexit had on? I know you're talking about hospitality and, you know, that it's a profession in Europe, but there were huge numbers of people who would come to the UK to work for 
a couple of years and then they might want to leave again. And yep. a lot of the time they did take up roles in hospitality. So what effect has them not, not coming here had? You can't sugarcoat this. Brexit has been catastrophic for hospitality. Absolutely catastrophic. I'd say it's up there with COVID and we have not recovered. At the end of this month, people are going to be paying more for their food because we've got more border checks kicking in. Um, hotels struggled massively when, when Brexit happened because during that period when COVID was coming, many people that worked in hotels were from the continent. They decided to go back home, spend lockdown with their, their family. And I don't blame them for that. But during that period, the visa requirements changed and they couldn't get back into the UK. Festivals, touring bands. Um, firstly, we'd, the headline is safer at Part Life would be on a circuit with Europe. So they might play in Cologne, then they might play in Naples, then they might play in Paris, and then they might come to Manchester, do that. We can't risk that anymore because they come with Arctic lorries full of their own production. They don't just use our in-house production, the big headliners. That could be stuck at the border for three days. Right. It's crazy. And then flipping that, looking at up up and coming bands, small bands that back in the day used to buy a van for 600 quid. Someone would drive it. All the band stuff would be in the back, maybe a couple of guys in the back as well. And they'd tour around Europe. That's not viable anymore because you've got to get different visas from all the different countries. So it's killing the music as well. And what was heartbreaking was the culture secretary at the time, Nadine Dorres. I mean, the fact that she ever became culture secretary is a joke in itself. But Nadine Dorries was offered the opportunity to go and resolve that and turned it down. And it's it's almost put a foot on the neck of the music industry. What effect has it had on on your lineup? Can you have well, uh, less European bands? Yeah, absolutely. So when we now look at English headliners, the first headliner that we had back after COVID was Dave, an English artist. Um, the Stormzy. So I mean, not a bad booking, is it? Really? Well, no, it's, it's a good. It must it's have a, been very disappointing for you. A bit, <laughs> bitterly. Yeah. But you know, it's. It's great for the British artists, but when you're trying to put on international festivals, the festivals in Europe are beating us. The festivals in Europe have got so much. You know, it's like it's like walking into a sweet shop. They can choose whatever they want to. We're just stuck with the bonbons in the corner. You know, that that's you, you're limited to choice. And how much, you know, has the clientele changed? Have the people who want to come to the festival has that changed at all? They're not. Um, no, one thing we are seeing is a lot of people now are leaving the UK to go to foreign festivals. Malta is absolutely bouncing at the moment of all countries. You know, they're, they're well, Portugal, um, they're thriving at the moment. And actually, do you know what? It's heartbreaking to say, but I think we're a bit of a laughing stock after Brexit. And I would love to see another poll taking place now because I guarantee it won't be 51%. What gives you that feeling? Why do you think we're a laughing stock? Do you know, I was saying this, I was saying this to my wife this morning, okay, to me, and she was, she was someone laughing at me, we're on the train coming down here, the train system, I'm going to go on a rant now, the train system in this country is an absolute joke, so I turned up this morning, I pre-booked my train a couple of days ago, woke up this morning, I was heading to the train station, guess what, Avanti West, it's like... Yeah, name them. Roll, name yeah, them. It's rolling a dice. Is it going to turn up? <laughs> Isn't it going to turn up? Today it didn't. So because of something that happened in Melbourne Keynes. So then I had to panic. Could I get one from Stockport? No. Could I get one from Crew? No. I had to head... I didn't want to let you down, so I had to head over to Sheffield, then get a rickety train on the way down here. This is the UK. People were stood on the train on the way down here for two hours. People were lying on the floor. Kids were on the floor. Someone's there with a walking stick... It's just wrong when you compare the offering. I don't know why I've gone on this tangent now, but when you, I'm talking about Great Britain. It's not Great Britain. It's broken Britain. And I think, you know, Brexit has certainly helped Great Britain. Well, I, I suppose it's contributing as well, because if you're organising events as you do regularly, that's going to factor into your planning, right? If you know that there's going to be a potential, potentially no Avanti trains during the month of August, hypothetically... Yeah you're going to be concerned about who can come to your festival. So look, I always want people to fight for the best ways they possibly can. And I, and I understand... I wasn't that. talking about the strikes, but if we're going to make it about the strikes... I was, I, well, you know, I have to mention it because it, we are always targeted. Mm. Um, every time there's a big event on in 
not just Greater Manchester, but the UK. So whether it's, we might have an all Manchester final at Wembley. It's highly likely we're going to have a, I mean, that's another thing that annoys me. What, you know, if it's an all Manchester final, why are we coming down to London to do it? Why not Newcastle or somewhere it's more accessible? But there's a good chance there'll be a train strike and we keep targeting these things. The knock on effect to that is it hurts hotels. It, you know, it does have this massive ripple effect around it. Now, could I possibly, I'd be a bit political, and could okay. I possibly pose that maybe the government should have the foresight to try and prevent a strike happening, I resolve a dispute before 100%. it... 100%. Uh, yeah. Get in the room, sort this out, don't leave it to the last minute. And I think the arrogance that we've seen recently is, from my understanding, they were, they were refusing to actually get in the room and talk about it, mm. thinking it would go away. Well, it's not going away. It's hurting people's livelihoods and businesses. It must have a huge knock-on effect. Massive. Mm. Can I take you back to your story about when you were spiked, would that be all right? Yes. Would you yeah, mind telling no, absolutely. that story? I don't mind at all. Do tell me. So, as I said at the beginning, I never, ever have a drink at my events if I'm working. And I think that's right. I see so many promoters these days who are backstage with bottles of champagne and, oh, look at me, I'm the big big cheese around here. And it's, it's, they never last, by the way, those promoters. They never last. If you saw your, your postman walking down your pathway, and he had a can of Heineken in his hand. You'd say, well, you, you're at work, why are you drinking? And said, I'd actually mind my business, but I would well, think I, it. I'd be out there, what <laughs> mate, what are you doing? So it's exactly the same with me. I don't drink at work. I have that responsibility of tens of thousand people, you know, in, in the field or 10,000 people at West Project, so I, I can't. But this one night, I'd had a night off, and we'd gone for dinner, my wife and I, in Manchester, Wares Project was doing a smaller event, actually. It was just one room, 3,000 people. And I said, well, why don't we just pop in um, and, you know, just see what everyone's up to. We'll have a couple of drinks there rather than going straight home. Because it's quite rare that I get a night off. A bit stupid going to see my own work, actually, on a night off. But I did. And we stood in the DJ box. And I'd picked a drink up, drank it. Didn't think much of it at all. But I remember five, ten minutes later... Demi and my wife saying, we know we should leave now, we should leave. And I thought it was a bit, a bit odd. But anyway, I didn't want to argue. She's from Scotland. You don't want to argue with anyone from, from Scotland. But we left. And as I was leaving, I felt my legs starting to go next to me. And luckily, one of the security was there. They got me into a taxi. I don't remember anything after that, nothing at all. And I woke up the next day and I felt fine to begin with. I just opened my eyes and um, Demi said to me, do you remember anything about last night? It's like, no, not at all. I'd come in, I'd started projectile vomiting, I'd collapsed in the bathroom, we had some glass scales, my head smashed the scales. I managed to get up again and I fell back so hard that the, some of the plasterboard, my head went through it at the back. Wow. So I was suffering from concussion and we can only put it down to I'd been spiked. Now, whether I had been spiked or whether I picked up somebody else's drink, by mistake, I don't know. We'll never know. But it was it was around that period when there was a lot of talk about, about spiking all over the news. I don't know if you remember, I think it was the November period. Um, and girls and women across most universities in the UK decided one night to hold a boycott. And we're not going to any nightclubs until it's taken seriously. I was actually in London the day of that boycott and Andy Burnham phoned me up say, look, his daughter had made him aware of this um, rally that was happening in the centre of Manchester. We should turn up and show our support. I was like, absolutely. I got on the train, came back. There must have been seven to 800 girls and women that turned up there. And the stories that we heard were just awful. You know, the, the impassioned speeches they were making. And it, at that point, it didn't seem to me as if this was a one-off thing that was happening. I'd heard about spiking and things, but... To the extent that they were talking about it, we were both, right, we need to do something about this. I'm going to say both me, me and Andy. So a week after we met uh, one, of the, uh, one of the unions at Manchester University and we heard more of the stories, I was like, okay, enough's enough. We're going to stop this. And we did. We rolled out um, on-site spiking tests in Greater Manchester. The Warehouse Project was the first one to do it. And it's essentially, if you feel unwell, you think you've been spiked, you go to see the paramedics and they have, it's almost like a pregnancy, t uh, pregnancy test. Mm. They can test it and straight away tell you whether you have been spiked or not. I have to say the good news is 
out of all the time we've been doing it, and we've only had two where we thought possibly yes, they have been spiked, but you know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, and we took a different approach in Greater Manchester, actually. It was Andy that did it, and I really respect what he said. Most other places were saying, look, girls, women, if you go out on a night out, don't leave your cup glasses when you go into the toilet. Maybe put a sticker on it or a, a top to your glass. And we were saying, well, no, that's wrong. We don't have to do that. I'm glad you so said that. So actually, we were saying, we're the problem. Men, lads, boys, we're the problem. Mm. We're the ones that need to change our attitudes. And we were saying, if you know someone that's done that, call them out. Because that's always, I think, the, the national narrative has always been that you, a, a woman should protect her own drink. It's not right. Rather than, yeah. Yeah. I was going to, I was really going to go for you there. I was going to okay, say the good. onus is not on the woman. I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> but you've got a huge problem in Manchester as well, because I mean, in the village, it's huge as well, isn't it? Spiking, you know, Absolutely. men are being spiked all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And you've got a real problem there with it happening to men and men not wanting to speak out about mm -hmm. it as well. So how do you, how do you plan to tackle that? Well, I think they are starting to now because we're talking about it more. We've got these kits on site. Um, and let's not forget the elephant in the room. I, I forget his name, but the, the biggest serial um, male rapist was in Manchester only a mm, couple of years on ago. On the canals. This what, sorry? On the canals, wasn't it? Um, oh, it was no, that near, was years before that. That was years before. It's, um, You've got a few. His name was Reynard Sigrir from memory. Right. And, and it was north of 100. And he was spiking people. So I think we're more open to talking about it, not just women and girls, but men as well. Mm. What well, I mean, what your experience of spiking, did it change your outlook at all in how you were going to combat it in your own events? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say what I, what I went through because it's nothing like how bad it could have been. Um, and I was lucky to have somebody there with me when I was going through it. But absolutely, at that point, it certain my ears were open. It's mm. like, we need to tackle this issue. Do you think it's something that central government take a lot of care about? The answer to that is yes, actually. So I was also the one, do you remember Suella Bravman? So for many, many years at Park Life and the Warehouse Project, we've been doing back of house drugs testing. I'm not pivoting, by the way. I'm going to come back to this. But we've been doing back of house testing. It saves lives. I've seen it with my own eyes how that saves lives. Back of house testing isn't you coming along with a bag and saying, oh, these are my pills. Can you test them? And some way I can take. It's not that. You take the confiscations from the front door. The police take them to a, a sealed um, container at the back where we've got scientists and doctors who within seconds will be able to test the drugs to see what's in them. If there's anything that's concerning, I'm not scared about talking about drugs because... If you can't stop drugs getting into a Category A prison, like Strange Rays or Belmarsh, what am I supposed to do with the field? So we have to educate people. That is the answer. And I'll put a picture out. It might be the, an orange tablet with Donald Trump's face on it and say, look, these are out there. They could be, you know, they're extremely concerning. Avoid at all costs. We'll do that. That saves lives. But I've also seen it where somebody was very, very poorly. And I mean, very, very poorly. And the friends were there with the doctors and the doctors were panicking, saying, give us a description of what they've taken. They gave a description. They found something in the, in the confiscations, tested it. Within seconds, that doctor that was dealing with that young girl then managed to save her life. We've been doing this the whole time. 48 hours before doors last year, swell up, and we've been planning it, by the way. You don't just put part life on and plan it two weeks before. We've been planning it months and months ahead. So I had a Brabham turn around and said, I don't want any more on-site testing at any festivals in the UK. And I hit the roof. I don't know if you remember, mm. you know, I would, it, it didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So the good news is James Cleverly is now talking and I, I think we will have drugs, test, drugs testing back at festivals this summer. Um, I haven't spoken about this yet, but I think it's coming. But also, we were campaigning to Swella Brabham to say, look, make, make spiking a specific criminal offence. Right. Because the law at the moment was 400 years old. And you don't need to understand nighttime economy, or you don't have to have ever been to a nightclub to agree that socialising now is far different than it was 400 years ago. So 
make spiking a specific criminal offence. James, Cl she said, no, not interested. You can stick to that 400 year rule, which upset a lot of people. But James Cleverly is now saying he's going to do that. So, and I have to say, fair play to him for doing so. It's really interesting what you just said about drug testing. So your approach to it is when someone is critically ill, you're actually able to diagnose them because there's drug testing available. Within seconds. That's Within seconds. Wow. Yeah. So have you had a festival yet where you haven't been able to offer drug testing? Last year. And what was that like? The whole team... And you talk about people working at events. When Park Life takes place, there's 4,500 people working behind the scenes during that one weekend. The vast majority of us were on edge because we'd worked Park Life for so many years. And when incidents, when you've got 80,000 people, there are always going to be incidents taking place. And you didn't know how to deal with them. And touch wood, nothing happened. But if it had happened, you know, it would have been on Swella Bravman's head because she stopped something that could have potentially saved someone's life. Wow. What would it look like? What would the perfect drug testing unit look like at a festival for you? Sort of like people can come in and have their drugs tested and handed back to them? No, so that's, that's front of house testing, yeah. which there's a big debate about that yet. I'm still sat on the fence on that. I think Bristol now have pioneered something where you can actually do that. I don't know fully the ins and outs, but... I wonder whether that condones drug use. I'm, I'm very, very, very comfortable with back of house testing, um, and it's it is the right approach. You know, I I've been in so many debates with people where they thought testing drugs was bad, and actually, when I've sat down with them and spoken about it, spoken about how it's done in conjunction with the police and with the council and with the paramedics and the doctors and the scientists in a laboratory that's guarded by police, then they come around to my way of thinking. So if you're not even doing back of house drug, uh, back of house drug testing, how on earth are they building a sort of nationwide database of what could be a dangerous pill? They're, they're not. They're not. The rest of Europe is. So you can get stats from Amsterdam and places like that. But when you're not back of house testing, you've no stats. Luckily, the good news is it was just one year, which I'm hoping was just a blip, 2013. And I do feel confident because the noises I'm hearing is they will be back this this season, this festival season. And I think it also, it puts parents' minds at rest as well. You know, my kids, a lot of these festivals that, that kids go to is normally after A-levels or something. It's going, let's go and party. Um, so I think when parents know there's drug testing there, they're supported. Wow. So when you're when you're running your festival, you're really in the mix. Then you're really actually getting involved with the behind the scenes workings. Event control. Wow. Yes. No. It's. Um, I mean, it's it that one weekend is taxing, to say the least. You know, normally one of the first ones there. Normally the foot, one of the last ones to leave. Um, and it's in the book actually. Something really. So my wife does a very good job of keeping my feet on the ground constantly and last year last year on the sunday because it's the saturday and sunday i was driving home and she would left an hour beforehand after partying all day with her friends loving life and i'm there working like grafting panicking about these eighty thousand people on site and i was driving home and she'd got into bed and had the gall to text me just got into bed don't forget tomorrow's bin day and i had to take out the bins I'm like, what a woman. Let's just talk quickly about um, post-pandemic and habits. Do you think that people's habits or wants have changed since the pandemic? So I think you have to split different age groups down. I think what's really interesting now is that group that really, I think, suffered the most during the whole period are sort of the 18 to 20 year olds, I think, at that time who should have been loving life and actually were locked away. Um, their lives have been affected. Whether this is a positive stat or a negative stat, I don't know. But one in five people under the age of 25 now don't drink alcohol whatsoever. Um, and we're seeing a sharp rise in that. And you talk about the big breweries before, if you watch Coronation Street now, for example, if you watch EastEnders, the pub scenes, you'll notice in Coronation Street, there's 0% alcohol, Heineken promoting it. So this is the new big thing. 
I think we're seeing a, a huge, huge shift now, a, a chasm between people going out. People are still going out, but they've been far, far more picky. So stats have come out recently. I think we've lost a 1,000 nightclubs in the last couple of years. They tend to be the carpeted chrome nightclubs that you might go to every Saturday with your mates. You probably go to the same corner, same group of friends, and you could probably know at one o'clock what track's going to be played because it's the same track every single week. Those clubs now are dying off. If you look at the big events where it's about the big global DJ and the massive production, they're still very, very busy, as are the tours. You know, if you look at the likes of um, Ed Sheeran's of the world or the Harry Styles of the world, still commanding huge ticket prices and selling out immediately. So, well, in 1975, you know, people were brawling to get so those tickets. People are still going out, mm. but they're going out for those big, big moments. A mate of mine owns a restaurant in Manchester. It's not high end, it's, it's between middle and high end. And he's noticed now that he's still busy on a Saturday. But it's not just people going out for a meal now. It's a birthday or it's an anniversary or they've not seen their nan for a few months and they're all going out for a meal. So it's now more of an occasion. So people's socialising habits have changed, but I think a lot of that now is more to do with the cost of living crisis than changing via COVID. During that COVID period, a lot of people said, and I knew they were wrong, but a lot of people said, oh, nightclubs will never reopen again because everyone's into the streaming palaver. Streaming's great and it served a purpose, but it would never ever beat going into a hot, sweaty nightclub or standing in front of a huge stage watching Madonna or something. You can't. It was a bad take, that was. It, it was a very bad take, yes. <laughs> how much do you think of it is, is to do with, um, I don't know how much you're experiencing this in Manchester, but in London, it's very difficult to get a drink in central London after 10 o'clock, really. I, I would say, as someone who is regularly at various pubs, you do get last orders is normally called about quarter past ten. Half past so I find 10. it I, I find it so strange, mm. and I don't know what the answer is. <clears throat> and I see this myself. I use, you know, I come down to London most Wednesdays, and five years ago I used to be so jealous of Soho. I'd love a Soho in Manchester, and now it's half ten. There's no one about. I'm mm. like, what what's happened here? I don't get it. Manchester is bouncing Monday through to Sunday every night of the week. It's heaving. And we've got, at the end of this month, actually, Co-op Live, which is the is Europe's best indoor arena, is about to open. So that's another 24,500 people coming into the city centre three times a week. And I'm speaking to hoteliers that said they've nev this, they are now looking at record room bookings. It's phenomenal for us. That's a big event, isn't it? I mean, about locals going out and about just to the pub on a weekend. Well, it, it is a big event, but just going back to what I said before, you probably wouldn't leave your hotel to go there. Straight away, you'd probably right. go to a pub as well first, first on the way. Yeah. And I, I think, I suspect, and I don't know what the answer is, but I suspect a lot more people are working from home in London because it's so vast. I think, is it 32 boroughs down here or 33? But, you know, I, you know, I know where you're going to, sorry, not to, to cut across you there, but I would disagree with you because I think the appetite is there. And I would say that the infrastructure isn't. Because if you go, I mean, you know, any day, any night of the week, if you head down to like Leadenhall Market, you mm. head, you know, anywhere in the city, anywhere in Soho, you know, over to the West End, it's busy. Yeah. People are out. And actually, a lot of the time, you're being thrown out or, you know, call cool out time has yes. been, you know, Last not actually orders. thrown out. <laughs> well, that's more of a Thursday. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, last orders have been called rather than people having left, left beforehand. So Asking someone from London then, what do you think that is? What do you think is creating that vacuum? Well, I think that it's, I would say that it's licensing. I think that pubs are terrified about noise complaints. Um, a few a few landlords who, are, who I'm very good friends with, they panic a lot about if they've got overspill from the pub and people are lining up outside and they're yeah. smoking and drinking, yeah. they could have their license revoked mm -hmm. or they might get a complaint from a neighbour. And they feel totally powerless in that situation. Mm. You know, you, there was one of the most famous um, instances of um, a, a, a local resident complaint was Trisha's on Dean Street in Soho, which is the new Everisto club. Um, someone had complained to them about their smoking area being a bit noisy. And it shut down the club's business for months. You know, they had to really scale back. And so all of the venues in that area 
are now so panicked. Panicking. Yes. It's just wrong. And this goes back to agents of change that we spoke about before. But, you know, these I have to make this point. These people that move into busy, thriving areas where you know there's a successful nighttime economy and they complain about the noise, they're damaging people's lives. It's the same as people that move next to churches and then complain about ringing the bell. I've read stories about people moving near farms and complaining about manure smells. I mean, what is wrong with people? Mm. If you want to live a quiet life, don't move into Soho or somewhere like it is nonsense. Mm. The argument that always gets raised as well, though, is that there's a lot of social housing in Soho, but it doesn't seem to be them who's complaining. Of course. <laughs> it's always the millionaires. <laughs> Do you have that issue, though, in Manchester? Do you have an issue with, with um, well, pubs having to close at sort of half ten because of noise? No. In fact, it's just the opposite. We're, we're pushing the hours up there. Um, you spoke about the village before. You know, the village, three, four, five in the morning, is is bouncing and busy. Um so the simple answer is no, we don't. And I'm, and I'm proud of, you know, we, we got labelled in the film 24-hour party people and I think we're living up to that name. So you'd say you were a 24-hour city, would you? We're definitely not a 24-hour city. Right. No one in, no one in the UK is a 24-hour city. Mm. But I can tell you something, we're getting there because Andy Burnham's just taken the brave decision to take buses back under public control. And I've always laughed when people have said, a 24-hour party city. I said, well, that's nonsense because how can you be a 24-hour party city when the trams finish at half 11? You know, you're not really thinking this through, are you? But... Are you going to change that? Buses back under public control and the night buses are back, which is great. And it's great because people are thinking, well, customers can get home safely, which is right. But I'm thinking more about staff. So staff that work within yeah. the nighttime economy that finish at one, two, three, four in the morning... Up until recently, I've had to pay for a taxi to get home, and it's not viable to get a taxi back. Um, and I heard of one story, actually, of a woman who worked in a nightclub in the city centre. She finished at four in the morning. She used to walk home at four in the morning, 35 minutes walk home, and that just it's not safe at all. So there's now an affordable option for staff to get back. Why is it right that people who work nine to five got public transport everywhere that people work in the night's economy don't so mm. it's a big step in the right direction so if you were to move to london and become our nighttime economy advisor what are you doing what are you making what are you going to improve i think uh, for first i wouldn't take the existing role because I, I think the model in greater manchester and the model in the west midlands is working where you're not contracted, so you're allowed to say and do exactly what you want. And um, I have that freedom to do that. And there have been times when, you know, if a council has wanted to close somewhere, I can step in and scream on behalf of that count uh, on behalf of that operator. Um, I have the luxury to do that. And I think I would change the model in London. I think that is the way it should work, um, where you have a little bit more teeth. In, in the game. I think also it helps being an operator because when you are an operator, you understand every single level. So, you know, I start at the bottom, so I understand what the bar backers are going through. I understand what security is going through because I normally stand on the door. I know all these different issues. So I think, and I think an operator has to take the role on as they have done in West Midlands as well. Right. Do you think that, uh, well, perhaps you might be pleased to come down and receive the salary? The role is unpaid, of course. Of you course. just do it for the love. I, I volunteer my time because, and I often get asked why I do this. And I think I do it because on paper, with two years and an E, I shouldn't be in this position. And I am. So if I can give back, I will give back. And, you know, I, I've set up, we got charitable status this year. My wife and I have set a charity up, the Sasha Lord Foundation. And I did it because when I was 16, 17, 18 at school, I was very anxious. Everyone in my class knew they wanted to become a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or a teacher. And I didn't have a clue. And I worked in that clothes shop. And I was the whole time thinking, that, yeah, am I going to be stuck in a clothes shop earning 20 quid a day for the rest of my life? And if I can take someone in the similar position that I was and bring them into hospitality or bring them into events and create a vocation for them, then that's what the charity is going to do. I think we've come for a nice full uh, come to a nice full circle there. So thank, thank you. you very much for coming in, and of course your book Tales from the Dance Floor is it available now? 
11th of April. 11th of April. But you can pre-order now. Yeah, but actually thinking about it, this is good. This is some terrible, terrible optics of my camera work here because by the time this goes out, it will be available. Excellent. <laughs> so you can buy it now. <laughs>